basically people would go into this position. They'd say like, oh, this move looks silly. Uh, it looks uh, it looks homosexual. <laughs> you know, these are like the criticisms I remember hearing about it. And it's like, well, man, I mean, like, look at look at jujitsu. What's the most efficient pasta victory against this particular opponent? He's dropping off for the choke here. We could see the finish. It's looking tight. Tight to Delpra. What is up, everyone? Welcome to the Everyday Jiu-Jitsu Podcast. My name is Matt Kwan. I'm your host. The Everyday Jiu-Jitsu Podcast is everything you need to know about Jiu-Jitsu. This week, we're going to discuss the donkey guard. This is a position... Um, that has recently become very popular and it's not a new position per se, but I would say it's a position that hasn't been taken seriously in jujitsu. Plus I want to talk about uh, fight pass invitational, which, um, which happened on Sunday night. But before we get into that, please like share, subscribe, uh, wherever you're listening to this, whatever platform you're on, please try to leave comments. If you can in the comment section, it really helps. If you want to support the show, I'll leave the links in the bottom. If you want to get everyday jujitsu podcast merchandise check the links in the bottom and you can let people know that you're a fan of the show plus it will help keep my lights on okay so first let's talk about donkey guard i have to admit the first time i saw donkey guard it must have been jeff glover it was probably you know probably looking at around 10 years ago when he was still an active competitor and uh i don't i don't just to be clear i don't really use the position the way that Jeff used it. He would literally turn around, show the guy his ass and, and <laughs> try and jump backwards. Sorry, my cat is coming up. Get off this thing. <laughs> I'm going to leave that in. Um, so he would literally turn around backwards, show the guy his ass, and he would try and jump on, like he's pulling guard backwards. Um, I don't find this to be my favorite application of the technique. I'm going to discuss entries and strategies and things like that. Uh, the reason why I started getting into donkey guard recently is because one of my students who's actually a blue belt put me in donkey guard and I was like, okay, this is a position I'm not really used to. I didn't really know how, uh, I didn't really know what to do. He couldn't submit me, but he did knock me over and, um, I was having a lot of trouble escaping the position after the round. I was asking him, Hey man, like you're into donkey guard where, what the hell is this? And he said, yeah, I've been watching, um, Owen Jones's new DVD, which is called, I believe it's called reverse cowgirl. I mean, reverse closed guard. Uh, <laughs> and Owen Jones is, um, I believe he's Irish, a young European guy. I think he won European trials. Um, again, don't quote me on this. I could be wrong. And he spends some time training at the B team. I actually have students who have visited B team and they've trained with Owen. They say he's really good, but he's recently used this donkey guard position. And so my students started using it and, uh, he actually has had a lot of success with it. And so I, I, I thought to myself, I, I said, you know, I've, I've known about this guard for years now. It's not something that's part of my game. It's something that I've kind of neglected and, uh, probably because it looks kind of silly and I never really paid it any attention, but there's one thing that I hate as an instructor, as a competitor, as a practitioner in general, I hate when somebody can use something on me and I have no idea what's going on, right? When something's so new, the technology is so new that you're basically, uh, you just play from behind the whole time and you're just trying to survive. And I've seen this happen many times in my jujitsu journey. One example would be during leg locks, uh, when nobody knew how to do leg locks about 10 years ago. And if you knew any kind of heel hooks, you would just instantly be able to submit everyone. You could spam leg locks. Another situation would be Baron Bolos. That was coming into flavor around the time I was in blue and purple belt. And this was a time where if you didn't know Baron Bolos, you were basically going to get your back taken and strangled reliably every time. So jujitsu has these interesting phases of evolution where new moves come into flavor and then people realize how to defeat them and then uh, they become easily defeated. They become negated. They're no longer a novel strategy to use at the highest level. And then uh, people now readjust their games to just include these techniques and the counters like you have to know them uh, kind of like in MMA, you know, before before anybody knew jujitsu, Hoist Gracie was the king. Then a couple UFC shows go by and Hoist Gracie is submitting everyone. And now people are realizing they have to train jujitsu. And so the, the sport changes to just include jujitsu. It's just a part of it. And usually in these 
evolutionary trends, what you what you tend to see is the classics reemerge, right? Half guard passing, even closed guard, things like this. Uh, just the the fundamentals and the the basics just come back into into play all the time, and uh, it's cool. It's it's one thing that I really love about the sport. Every now and then you'll see something new, and you'll uh, I'll just become like uh, basically autistic with it. I'll just study it. Uh, relentlessly add it to my game, show it to my team. And before I know it, everyone knows how to shut it down. And it's, it's, uh, it, it's time for the next thing, right? So this is kind of how uh, the trends operate in jujitsu. Um, I think it was even one of the, one of the Gracie promotions. I think they banned donkey guard. I could be mistaken with that. Um, but basically people would go into this position. They'd say like, oh, this move looks silly. Uh, it looks, uh, it looks homosexual. <laughs> you know, these are like the criticisms I remember hearing about it. It's like, well, man, I mean, like, look at, look at jujitsu. It's, uh, a very gay sport, right? And, and we, we mock, we mock it because of that, but it, it, it is like, we're rolling around with each other. We're inside our partner's legs. This is just, um, it's just another position. And now the way I look at it, man, it's a, it's a fantastic position to score from. Uh, like sweeping and it's a great position to go for leg locks as well. We're going to talk about all these things uh, in a moment. So like I said, I just recently watched that reverse uh, cowgirl, I mean reverse closed guard by Owen Jones and um, I, I really enjoyed it. It was a short DVD, but sweet. And sometimes, you know, when you watch Jordan, uh, John Danaher, or Gordon Ryan DVDs, you know, you're getting into the seventh, eighth chapter and you're like, holy shit, there's just so much information while that is amazing and undoubtedly valuable. Uh, it, it is at the same time more difficult to absorb. And I find the shorter DVDs, you know, the Craig Jones and, um, you know, Owen Jones, Nikki Rodriguez, we're looking at four or five chapters, usually maximum. And, uh, usually these chapters are like half hour to an hour long. And so what this m means is yes, there's not as much information, but at the same time, I find it much more easy to digest, much easier to implement and to retain this information. So, uh, take it for what it's worth. I think short DVDs definitely have their place, especially when it comes to information retention. There are a couple of things that, uh, I think uh, I definitely think, you know, playing with the position that uh, there could be a second volume of the donkey guard for sure. I've already thought of what I would put on there if I was going to make a donkey guard instructional. Some th some things that I would like to see would be uh, rolling footage. I think uh, nowadays you kind of have to include rolling footage into your DVDs or if you're not you are um, missing out on a huge opportunity to add value to the instructional the way that Gordon does it. He's one of the only guys who does it. I know Craig has started doing it with his DVDs now. Uh, the, the rolling footage and the commentary footage, I think, is one of the best parts of instructionals nowadays. And I even remember hearing um, there was a video about uh, with Owen O'Flanagan that popped up on my Instagram feed the other day. And he was talking about how when he watches Gordon's DVDs, he tends to watch rolling footage first. So he realizes what he's actually using in a live situation. And then he, he watches the instructional so he can almost trim the fat in a way where he identifies the most commonly used techniques that, uh, the, that Gordon is utilizing from those uh, specific positions. So I, f I found that fascinating, right? Anyways, that's my spiel on, uh, <laughs> watching instructionals and getting the most out of it. And again, you, I do have an episode on optimizing your performance with instructionals. You can go and check that out. It was one of the earlier episodes. So, um, <clears throat> yeah. Uh, one thing I love about donkey guard is I, I like, I'm, a I'm, I, I guess I fancy myself a leg locker. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm decent at leg locks. Okay. I can, I can hold my own at the black belt level. I can submit a lot of people at the black belt level. I have a good, I have good success with leg locks. I would say it's one of my, it's one of my more uh, a common, one of the more common aspects of my game. I'm no uh, Gordon Ryan. I'm no Lachlan Giles, but I'm I'm decent at legs. And anyways, I've I one of my main attack vectors in no gi obviously is leg locks. And uh, one thing I've realized is donkey guard entries blend perfectly into my game because I'm inverting from the bottom, going into. Um, Kiss of the Dragon, I'm going into K guard. These positions are perfect positions to enter the donkey guard. And 
one thing that's interesting, let's say I was going to go into K guard and throw my leg over backside 50, 50, you know, a couple of years ago when Lachlan was submitting people in the absolute division at ADCC, the, this leg attack was so new that people didn't know, oh, I just back step out of it. They, they would try and sprinters escape out and you can't sprinters escape out from the backside 50, 50, because if it's done properly, your, your entangled leg, uh, that leg becomes internally rotated and it's, impossible to sprint out you have to back step now people didn't know that back then and so Lachlan Giles is heel hooking all these big motherfuckers in the absolute division um one thing about entangling the legs in this way is your partner will always have some kind of a spinning escape okay um they'll because they you're only entangling one leg and they have a free leg that free leg is going to always give them uh, the ability to base out. It's always going to give them some kind of an ability to uh, be mobile and to scramble. And uh, you're going to have to chase them once you entangle their leg, essentially looking for a dig on the heel or whatever. When you entangle the donkey guard, when you trap your partner's hips in between your legs rather than one leg, um, if they do a defensive roll, they sweep themselves and you end up on top often pass the guard. So they can't really spin out. You just gain so much more control over your partner. It's literally the same as a closed guard situation in that you are slowing your partner down and for a moment you're safe. You can rest. Um, <laughs> as we all know, the famous quote by John Danher, why ignore 50% of the body? He's using this as a reference to when he first saw Dean Lister attack in the legs and he thought to himself, hmm, why neglect 50% of your body, right? I, <laughs> I've i been just saying, why ignore 50% of the legs, right? Why not entangle both legs now that you have your partner's torso and their hips inside your guard, essentially? Uh, you have a, a highly undervalued amount of control over them, especially if, let's say, you're getting blitz passed, your partner's coming in, they're trying to get chest to chest and they're passing um, loose passing around the outside, moving into side control, you can often throw your legs up and just entangle them in the donkey guard. And I've used this pretty effectively in training, even just in the short amount of time I've used it. So as a leg locker, I've integrated it into my game very, very quickly. Basically, as soon as I finished the DVD, I was ready to start donkey guarding people and just use it right away. Um, uh, it, it, another reason why it's awesome, it's it's such a new position and it's not a new position. I know for those who play it and I know if, if Jeff Glover heard this, he'd be like, dude, I've been doing this for decades, right? Um, it's not a new position, but I believe um, just the way that it has been used recently from what I've seen, I, I, I don't rem recall seeing Jeff Glover do a lot of these leg locks. Um, and I, uh, I don't recommend jumping backwards into, into donkey guard. It's not a, an entry I would use, but if you're entangling and going into K guard, it's easy to go into donkey guard. Um, so I think the way that it is being used right now is somewhat novel. And as we all know, when there's a position that's novel or it's something that's been neglected by the majority of the jujitsu population, th that's a perfect environment to get a lot of short-term success out of it before everyone starts learning how to use it. Um, <clears throat> a lot of people could get caught off guard if you put them in donkey guard, which is, uh, again, extremely valuable, uh, just being a novel position. So there's definitely an opportunity to kind of get ahead of your training partners, especially if you have training partners who reliably pass your guard on a regular basis. I think donkey guard is actually a pretty good solution to that problem. And I've used it in the gi as well. Uh, I've played with it with a sleeve grip and things like this. And now, and that's even harder for them to maintain top position because now you can, uh, take away their post and sweep them in that direction. So I think it's applicable for Gi and Nogi. Um, all right, let's talk about kind of the two main situations that you're going to find your opponent in your donkey guard. So the two main scenarios that I see is your opponent's two knees on either side of your body or your opponent's two knees on one side of your body. Um, they're both great positions. Personally, for me, I have a lot of success when my opponent's two knees on either side of my body. I, I really like this configuration. It opens up a lot of toe holds and A blocks. We're going to talk about the A block in a sec. Um, when the two knees are on the outside, it's similar to that of a backside 50-50, except your partner, again, can't roll or they sweep themselves, and you can do inside heel hooks from that position. I've also considered transitioning from donkey guard into uh, into backside 50, 50. Yes, you can do that. But again, you're going to give your partner, you're going to give your partner the ability to spin when you do this. So, 
Uh, a lot of the time now, I just rather keep my legs locked above my partner's hips as opposed to dropping them down and entangling a single leg. I actually have a match versus Daniel Salder who won his match on who's number one a couple weeks ago. I fought him in the Portland Open. He's a black belt from Atos, and I actually heel hooked him from the donkey guard. And I was pushing backwards on him, and he was basing out on his knees, and I was trying to sweep him, so I was threatening a sweep by pushing him, and he kind of resisted, and in doing so, he opened his leg slightly. And so what I did was I threw my leg inside, entered the saddle, rolled through, and heel hooked him. Um, and he's a high-level black belt. I think he got bronze at... Uh, at uh, Nogi Worlds this year. So it definitely is is an effective position for sure. <clears throat> when the uh, when you have the two knees on one side of the body, inside heel hooks available, you can also leg knot your partner and flip them over. Usually when I sweep someone from the donkey guard, all I'm doing is I'm <laughs> trapping their legs, hipping in and bridging over my shoulder. And quite often the power of my hip hinge is enough to take my partner over. It's, it's a very easy, I find it very easy to sweep people from there. Um, alternatively, with two knees on either side of your body, you're kind of scooping both shins in front of you uh, with your arms. I'm just flexing my muscles right now for those who are just listening. And from this position, very easy to sweep people from. Uh, and and uh, like I said, you, you know, IBJJF, you sweep someone from there, <laughs> you know, you, you just got two. And because they don't have a guard, assuming their legs aren't locked behind your back, but they're in front of you, why couldn't you play the rules and just point harvest and roll over and do it again and do it again? Kind of like, you know, you mount someone and then you just pull them into closed guard and then you sweep them again. In that case, you would get six uh, and then you can just roll over and do it again. Whereas in, and there's no penalty for doing that. Whereas in, uh, <clears throat> in the donkey guard, you sweep someone, it's not going to count as mount, but it would count as a sweep. And because they don't have a guard, you can roll over again and just keep doing this again. Keep point harvesting. In an ADCC situation, you go to donkey guard and you sweep someone, uh, it's going to be a four point score because you're going to land past the guard. Uh, however, if you roll to the bottom again, it is technically, <clears throat> it is technically a sweep, but what you could do is you could preface your roll with a, a cheesy toe hold on the foot, which is available to you. It's right in front of you. And then you could roll to the bottom position and then do it again and again. So like, uh, in terms of competition, this is a very effective scoring position. It is, uh, it's easy to sweep from there. It's hard for your opponent to do anything and you can point harvest under different rule sets. So, and there's always a threat of submission. So as you can see, there's a lot of shit you can do to your opponent with this in the situation, uh, within this situation. Um, in terms of grip configurations, uh, you can, the worst thing we we could do is let our opponent get their two legs behind our back because that's what we have on our opponent when we're in donkey guard. So if my, my opponent's two legs are behind my back, now I have no access to the legs as levers. There's no submission threats anymore. It's going to be more difficult to sweep them because they also can engage their hip hinge. Uh, I have no legs as levers to uh, control them for base when I knock them over. It's just... Yeah, it turns into a stalemate position. And usually when I gamify donkey guard in the training room, I say, if your opponent ever gets their two feet behind your back, just reset, you lost. So it's paramount that we keep two or one of our partner's legs in front of our body. Um, if you have two legs in front of your body, generally I find it easier to sweep. If you have one leg in and one leg out, usually it's behind your one arm. This now is a great situation because it allows you to open up for toe holds, A blocks. You can go out, rattle off attacks on your partner's legs. Um, generally, if you get to, let's say, a reverse Ashigurami, for those who don't know, it's where I basically have the saddle, but now I'm like in a knee bar position facing towards my partner's feet and I have both of their legs scooped. This is reverse Ashi, one of my favorite leg lock positions. If you're ever in that position and you start attacking with a toe hold, the most common in, uh, instinctual response from your opponent is going to be to kick your feet and disrupt the dig of the toe hold with, the, with their second leg. Uh, this is just a natural thing. People buddy up their feet and disrupt their, uh, their partner's dig or toe hold with their foot. This is what I would do. This is what everyone's going to do. Um, 
especially when you have both legs like this. So if in a donkey guard, if your opponent's one foot is behind your back, they don't have that secondary leg to kick. So we're always constantly looking for a situation where we have one of our partner's legs in front of us and one of our partner's legs behind us. And a lot of the time what I'll do is I'll just threaten a toe hold from donkey guard. Usually uh, it has to be from two knees on either side. I threaten a toe hold. My partner starts kicking at my hands and then I'll just switch to the second leg and I will swim. I'm just making a motion in the video for those watching. I'll swim my one arm over and, tr and insert my elbow behind my partner's calf knee area. And when I do this, now I can sort of use my elbow to parry my partner's leg as they try to get their foot back inside to disrupt my dig. And this is how we can go into our toe holds. We're not going to talk about toe hold mechanics. Um, Go study that shit on your own time. Go go get uh, Gordon Ryan or John Danaher's uh, toe hold DVD. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, with one leg in, one leg out, we can do the toe hold. Another thing we can do is we can do the A block. Now, this is a move that I only learned a couple of weeks ago when I started studying this. Uh, this guy, what's his name? Abraham... Uh, I'm not sure what his last name is. He trains at New Wave. He's always getting his ass kicked by Nicholas Mirigali in in the uh, uh, in in his Instagram reels. But he's he's got this move that has been recently coined the A block. And essentially, what it is is it's like a toe hold, but in in a toe hold, I'm pushing the toes uh, like a Kimura grip and and pulling at the heel as I push the toes in. In this case, the same hand that wraps around the arm that wraps around the heel is also grabbing the toes. Then you reinforce the toes as if you were doing a toe hold. And then you kind of cover with your other, you cover the hand that you were grabbing the toes with, with your other hand to reinforce it. I've seen people use different gripping configurations for the A block. I'm not sure which one's the best. Um, but as long as you have a pulling force on the heel and a pushing force on the toes, mechanically, it's the same as a toe hold or a heel hook. And uh, furthermore, I've asked a couple of high level referees that I know who are involved in IBJJF. And they said that uh, they believe that this would be IBJJF gi legal because it is sort of a hybrid between a toe hold and a heel hook. But because of the positioning of the foot, it is not technically a heel hook. It's not in your arm uh, the way that a heel hook would look. And, you know, uh, even though mechanically it's about the same, it is, uh, I guess, legal under these situations. So that's also really great. Now we have a, an extra leg lock at our disposal from a strong position gi or no gi, uh, IBJJF, ADCC, even in the master's division in IBJJF gi, it, it's, it's legal, which is, uh, extremely versatile, right? So that's, um, that's fantastic. So yeah, again, just with gripping configurations, we want to avoid having our partners two legs behind our back. We always want to think about attacking one of the legs. And then as they defend, hopefully we can isolate one by swimming our arm through and, uh, and yeah, and catching it a toe holder or an A block. So really, really great position um, to use from there. Now, uh, what else could I say about donkey guard? I've had some issues getting into donkey guard from uh, seemingly available situations. Like let's say you're in North South, you got your partner in North South, you try to go into donkey guard. Uh, I, this is not easy to do because as you step over your partner's arms, they tend to frame and bring their knees inside. And now before you know it, you're in a crab ride. So you can't, it's hard to enter. I would find from uh, positions like top pins, just because you open up space as you step over their torso and their arms can come in and dominate the inside space. So I actually prefer to enter from the bottom with leg entanglements. Uh, another great position to enter from actually would be butterfly ashy, where you are kind of in an outside ashy, but you pummel your bottom leg underneath in behind in a butterfly hook. And from here we can invert our body down to the floor and we can shoot our hips up into a, a donkey guard. And if you have a scoop on their leg, now you can put almost knee bar pressure on that extended leg, push your hips back into their hips and elevate their foot off the floor. And it knocks them over almost instantly. This is a great way to enter as well. I've been playing with this. Um, those are kind of my favorite entries. Not a big fan of entering from the North South. If I am in donkey guard, this is another thing. Uh, he, Owen does include this, some some stuff in the DVD as how to exit the position once you sweep and once you get on top. Um, you cannot just step over your partner because you don't have any control over their upper body. And so what they could do is they could just come up on a tight waist. They could come up on a tight waist and just start wrestling up. So you do need to find graceful ways to exit the position once on top. Uh, there's a couple that I've played with. One, one I've done is I've just dropped my head uh, and sort of walked my way back to north-south. You could also back step to one shoulder 
and uh, I haven't shown that in a video yet, but you could sort of backstep into one shoulder and uh, and move into like a topside crucifix position. I've been using this as well. Um, another thing I've been I've been really liking is sort of scooping both legs and just shelving them and hiking them up and then pivoting my body almost in like an S mount type position around the legs. And then from here, it's almost like you're in the saddle on top, but you're entangling both legs rather than just one. And then from here, what you can do is you can look to turn and punch under hooks and things like this. I think this is a, also a decent way to, to exit the position if you sweep. But if you really think about it, why would you exit it? I mean, you, ha you have your partner controlled, you can do submissions, you can point harvest. <laughs> Uh, one of my biggest joys right now in training is just to go to that position and watch my partners kind of try to solve the puzzle. And, uh, and I just keep scoring on them over and over again. It's, it's, a uh, it's pretty funny. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, we've talked about exiting the position. We've talked about entering the position. Um, what else? There's a couple of other things I wanted to talk about. Oh, uh, if you're at, we haven't really talked about exiting the position, actually, how to escape Donkey Guard. So I just put a video on my YouTube channel, on the Everyday Jiu-Jitsu Podcast YouTube channel. Every Saturday, I put out a technique video for uh, that I taught that week, just like a free technique video. You know, if you want more content like this, you can subscribe to my online academy and get access to it. Um, but every Saturday I put out a technique video and the one that I put out last week, uh, maybe I'll link it in the show notes is an escape to donkey guard, how to address the position. And, um, we were, we were basically just playing around with it and saying, okay, like, can you, can you hold me down? Can you put me, can you return my hands to the floor? People, I've seen people do different things in donkey guard. Some people prefer to have two legs on either side of their partner's body. Some people prefer to have two feet on the same side. Some people try to stand straight up, uh, I find this difficult because I feel like my partner can knock me over. My favorite way to do it, again, it's included in the video, uh, which you should definitely check out. Uh, I treat it almost as if I'm escaping like a closed guard. Usually if I'm in nogi, I'm escaping closed guard, put my two hands in my partner's armpits, and then I do like a downward dog position and then walk my way up into vertical posture and then I'm popping the guard open. In this situation, I go right into downward dog. So I'll even if he's got both of my legs controlled, I can usually put my two toes, uh, my two feet on the floor and I engage my toes. I go into a downward dog and then when he tries to hip hinge and push me forward, can't knock me forward because I'm in base. Then what I usually do is I'll do some feet pummeling. So I know he wants to isolate one of my legs. So I'm trying to pummel my the soles of my feet into my partner's biceps and armpits. Usually what I do is like a, a cross pummeling method where I'll take my right foot and use it to free my left foot. Then once my left foot goes inside, I, I put my right foot in. At any time, if my partner abandons donkey guard to go into my legs, um, they now no longer have donkey guard, albeit I will be defending a leg entanglement, but they won't have the same donkey guard position. So it's it's still pretty good for me and I feel comfortable at, uh, escaping leg lock. So it's not a big, uh, not a big deal. And then once I get two feet in the armpits, I'm in this downward dog position. Now, usually what I'll do is I'll just pinch my knees together in front of my partner's torso. And now my knees are driving into their belly button and I'll just round my back and push myself back and the donkey guard pops open. And then I can control the thighs, drop my head and go move into north, south or a topside crucifix essentially. So this is uh, my solution for donkey guard. And, uh, you know, if you have other options, uh, solutions, please drop it in the comment section or leave links to videos in the comment section. If you have a cool way of getting out of donkey yard, this one, I think, uh, from what I've seen is one of the better ways, uh, so far. There's also a situation that will happen when your partner sits out. Again, this is included in the same video. If your partner's two legs are on the same side of your body, if you can control the, one of their legs, you can generally always either go for a heel hook or, uh, again, um, control their feet. But sometimes what your partner will do is they'll sit out and now you're let, you can't grab your partner's legs because they're kind of hidden and they're side on. And this can be tough because it's hard to hip hinge at this angle. It's hard to knock them back forward. And like I said, you don't control their legs in any way. A lot of the time, what will happen here is if you hang out here, your partner will be able to pop open your donkey guard and turn into you and you're, uh, you're somewhat face down. This is an annoying situation. So um, there is a way to enter a crucifix from here and also a position that I've 
recently discovered uh, John Chan showed it to me. John Chan of Nimbus Grappling here in Vancouver. One of my students, one of my good friends. And honestly, he teaches me probably more than I teach him. A uh, very good instructor. So he he showed me this high ground position. And this position known as the high ground is, uh, it's like a modified crucifix attack on the top side. Again, you need to check out the video. But basically, if my partner sits out, I'm going to just do like a small hip hip escape and then let go of the donkey guard and my leg will chop down on my partner's arm trapping him on the far side and now from here we either have a s grip lock on the near leg to hit a diagonal ride or we can control the near shoulder to enter the full crucifix so there's lots of good crucifix opportunities too should my partner sit out to one side and i can no longer access their legs you're probably listening to that right now, and if you're not fully autistic like me, you're probably like, uh, what the fuck are you talking about? Just go look at the video, okay? It'll all make sense. Anyways, so uh, that about wraps it up. You know, Donkey Guard, um, I, I'm really enjoying this position a lot. Like I said, it's brand new. Um, I'm watching guys in the training room use it uh, very successfully, and I can't wait to till the day when I get back to competition and I can try using this stuff because, man, it is uh, it's a cool position. I don't care how gay it looks. Super effective. Uh, the leg locks are great from there as well. The reason why I'm not competing right now is because um, uh, I should actually just talk about this before we talk about the Fight Pass Invitational is I recently had PRP done on my shoulder. So again, I'm not a, a scientist, but PRP is platelet rich plasma where they take your blood and they spin it. And, uh, I guess this, uh, this sort of concentrates the blood in a way where there's more platelets and then they insert the blood back into your, uh, the area of the injury. And it's supposed to, uh, create inflammation, which creates, uh, it stimulates and creates growth of cells, I guess. So it, it, in a way it kind of kickstarts your healing. So I've had a couple of shoulder issues. This actually occurred before I did trials last year. So it would have probably occurred in like June or July. I remember, uh, my, my right SC joint here. Uh, I think, I think that means sternoclavular sternoclavicle man I, I'm, I'm really unlearned for this podcast anyways it's this bone where the call uh, the collarbone meets the sternum there's a joint here and it's kind of become displaced and it's uh uncomfortable to say the least that's sort of a newer injury that i like i said it happened a couple couple months before trials last year and i've just been dealing with it ever since and it's not healing the more i train the the worse it gets so um I really wanted to give that a chance to heal. And so what this, uh, that plus an old labrum tear that I got back in the blue belt days would have been over 10 years ago. Um, that's an older injury. And so my right shoulder is pretty out of alignment. Uh, it's hard for me to do any overhead pressing or any framing. And so I decided I would spend a couple grand and get PRP. And uh, uh, PRP is basically a step above prolotherapy and a step below stem cell therapy. And like I said, the idea is for it to uh, create inflammation in the area and essentially kickstart a window of healing. So my labrum, you know, it's not, uh, there's no way that it could heal after 10 years. That window is kind of closed. So as they put in PRP, the theory is that it will create a window of opportunity for uh, cells to uh, regenerate in that area. Um, and same thing with the SC joint the the window of healing is kind of done because I've been training through it this whole time. And so in theory, by adding the PRP, it creates a new window of healing opportunity. And uh, I, I'm, I'm honestly just hoping that it'll kind of fuse to my ribs and uh, the, the collarbone will be, um, you know, sort of what it was before. I also understand, you know, I'm 36 now, just turned 36 and uh, sometimes when you're in your mid thirties to forties, you your body's just not going to be the same, especially when you've been doing grappling for this long. But I said to myself, you know, before I compete, before I get back to training, I want to give it all the, I want to throw everything at it that I can. I'm taking peptides for it. Um, I'm trying to throw the kitchen sink at it because I really want to see if I can heal it before I go back into training. And I saw Kyle Terra post, something the other day about how he got stem cells in his shoulder. And he's talking about how, you know, you, you put enough years into jujitsu. A lot of it becomes, uh, trying to fix old injuries. And I'm going through that right now. So I understand exactly what he's talking about. And so we'll see. I'm, a, I'm on my third week of healing. I've heard people say, you know, take a month off of training before you do anything live, whether it's uh, for me, hockey or jujitsu. Um, I've had other people say they got PRP and after, about three months of, of uh, three months since the injection, that's when they notice the full benefit. So I'm still kind of in the early, um, 
I'm kind of in the early stages of healing. This is my third week now. I haven't been training in three weeks, which really sucks. Uh, but an interesting thing about not training. And again, I've done that a lot because, um, you know, injuries over the years, I shift my mindset to, uh, being more of a present coach when this happens because I'm not sparring and I can watch people train. I can give them more as a coach. Um, at least from a mental side of things, uh, I'm not sparring with them, but I can be more present and watch each individual athlete train. And it's interesting. It's interesting what making that shift from training to coaching, uh, because in my profession, especially if you like to compete and you like to train, you're kind of wearing many, many hats. And now I can just focus solely on coaching and yeah, you see a lot more and you, um, you know, you can see a lot of uh, what people are doing well and how, where they're struggling to, and give them arguably more, um, more valuable advice. Okay. So hopefully that works out. I'll, I'll keep you guys posted right now. The, I'll, I'll be honest guys. If you've never got PRP before, PRP before it fucking sucked. It hurt a lot. I don't have an issue with them drawing blood. I've had so many blood tests over the years because of my autoimmune issues and things like that, that blood test and drawing blood doesn't bother me at all. But man, they basically took an ultrasound machine and they're looking around the areas uh, of the SC joint and the shoulder. And they gave me like three or three or four in each location, three or four injections. So we're talking seven to eight shots of this PRP and they take this ultrasound machine and they're zone, they're looking around and then they like find the spot and they stick the needle in. Man, it fucking sucked so bad. Like a giant needle right into my rib cage. Basically, I could feel my ribs expanding and burning um, at the end of it. And by the seventh or eighth shot, I was going into shock. I was white in the face, feeling dizzy. I was shaking and sweating. Um, I held it together pretty good. But then after that, I was like about to stand up and I was like, no, I think I'm just going to lie down here. I think I'm going to pass out. And he gave me the oxygen mask or whatever. And I came to, but man, it, the first three or four days after the shots, I couldn't even lift my arm. It was so fucking painful. And now I'm at the point where it feels essentially what it felt like before the injections. So I'm hoping it'll turn a corner. I'm hoping that it will have a good effect, but again, I will keep you posted. Okay. Let's talk about fight pass. Let's talk about the fight pass review, uh, that happened on Sunday. So this would have been the fight pass invitational six, and, uh, it was a stacked card. So first we're going to talk about J rod versus Jonathan Alves, J rod from B team, Jonathan from, um, from, uh, AOJ and Jonathan is a world champion. J Rod won um, West Coast Trials a little bit ago, and this is a cool match. Jonathan Alves usually fights, if I'm not mistaken, at lightweight, but he has recently put on some pounds. I think he weighed in at like 185 or something, and uh, you know he's he's really fucking good. Jonathan's awesome, and it was a, an amazing match. I thought J Rod really outclassed him. J Rod is hit and miss, right? He's, he can be really hot or really cold sometimes. And man, he was on, he had some beautiful wrestling exchanges, um, and was able to submit Jonathan Alves. That was an incredible match. I really, really enjoyed that. And I thought it was actually going to be a little bit closer than what it, what it was. Gerard just looked on his game. So next was Ronaldo Jr. from Atos. Uh, again, really, uh, I believe they call him the human highlight reel. Uh, Ronaldo Jr. is an amazing competitor going against Cody Steele. Cody's a guy who I fought before, and I know how tough he is. Uh, again, it was it was an awesome match. I, I would say, you know, the, Ronaldo really dominated the regulation. He had some size on Cody, and uh, he was able to win some good wrestling exchanges. He was able to mat return Cody a couple of times. Some pretty hard impacts as well. And uh, he won by referee's decision. That was in, in overtime. That was an amazing match. I really, really enjoyed, uh, you know, watching watching someone like Cody Steele, someone who I've competed against go against Ronaldo jr. And, uh, just have an absolute barn burner. It was, it was awesome. I mean, all the matches were awesome in general, but that one, uh, was very, very impressive. And then we saw Victor Hugo, uh, defeat Roosevelt Souza. I'm not surprised by this at all. You know, Victor Hugo, he recently just fought Nicky Rod and, um, I no I don't know if dominating is the way that I would describe the match because even Nikki did pass his guard briefly a couple times but uh Victor's regarding you know and his closed guard his classic jujitsu is really difficult uh for anyone to deal with and I'm not surprised at all that he was able to beat uh, Roosevelt Souza not to shit on Roosevelt but I think Victor Hugo is just he's really at the he's at the uh the high end of the food chain in terms of jiu-jitsu athletes there's your gordon ryan's craig jones nicholas mergalis and victor hugos and i you know i think that these guys are uh they're they're at the very top victor 
he was the only guy that Gordon couldn't submit at the last ADCC. Just incredible jujitsu, big guy, and moves like a small guy. So I wasn't surprised by that. And then we had Mason Fowler with uh, Pedro Mourinho. I think he subbed him with the Katagatame, the arm triangle from the top. Um, Pedro actually took Mason down and had Mason in some some difficulty in the regulation. And then Mason came back and uh, and was able to just dominate Pedro from the top position, which doesn't surprise me. Um, Mason's Mason's awesome, especially under this. I think they said he's five and oh now at fight pass invitationals. He has two previous wins over Craig Jones um, under the previous rules where there was overtime. And man, I'm so glad that they took away the overtime rules in the fight pass invitational because those EBI rules, I think they should just stay right in EBI and not go anywhere else. I, I, I can't stand overtime rules like that. I prefer things like golden score or, you know, 80 CC overtime rules. I think that's more of a true expression of who actually won the match rather than just getting the match to the overtime starting on the back. But Mason Fowler, I mean, he's right up there. He was a guy who was supposed to fight Gordon. And that was a fight that I was looking forward to so much because at this point, who the fuck can beat Gordon? We, we really don't know. And um, I was just excited to see somebody who hasn't, uh, you know, or, or I'm not sure if they have fought, actually. Maybe they have. I can't remember. But some somebody new for Gordon to test himself against. And Mason is no joke. You know, he's he's a beast. He's he's he is able to win at the higher levels. Um, but still, I don't, I don't think he'd be able to beat Gordon. Not when Gordon's in his prime. It's not a match that I think he could win, but awesome performance last night by, uh, Mason Fowler. I'm recording this on the Monday. So, uh, the, the event was last night. Then we had Nicky Rod versus Roberto Jimenez, which was a very exciting match. And Roberto Jimenez, I believe he has a previous win over Nicky Rod. Roberto Jimenez is such a gamer, uh, albeit he's plant-based, I believe, <laughs> uh, <laughs> you know, one of the strongest vegetarians I've ever seen. Um, he's got the type of game that is, you know, it makes sense that it would cause fits for Nicky Rod because it's very movement based and he takes risks. Nicky Rod likes to get people into the body lock. He likes to immobilize them, pin them, um, you know, and take away their movement where he can kind of chill and cook them over time. And Roberto Jimenez is the kind of guy who made Nicky Rod work. And even after the match, Nicky Rod was out of breath and he said, you know, we moved a lot. This guy uh, this guy forced me to move a lot and he, he was trying to get his breath back. And so I think that's, that's a good way to, you know, beat Nicky Rod over time, especially in a, in a match that goes longer than 10 minutes is to make him work, make him move, make him hunt you down. You know, don't, st don't let him lock his hands around you because once that happens, he doesn't need to move. He can just, uh, pass you with body locks. And so I feel that, uh, yeah, that was a, that was a great match too. Although I'm not surprised Nicky Rod won by decision. Then we have, uh, Nicholas Mergali and Mateus Denise, um, Mateus, you know, previous ADCC champion beating, uh, Craig Jones and Nicholas Mergali. Um, I believe he got, what did he get? Did he get bronze in that division in the 88 division? Um, I'm way off 99 division. Anyways. Nicholas, you know, was saying it's not going to be competitive. It's not going to be, a, you know, I feel bad for my, <laughs> my opponent and all this stuff. Um, and man, he went out there and he dominated Mateus Denise. Good, good wrestling exchanges where athletes were feeling each other out for a couple, a couple of minutes. And then Nicholas was able to take it down to the floor and um, easily. Uh, he, he basically was in an outside ashy. Mateus Denise had a underhook on the leg. So he was actually exposed to back takes and all Nicholas did was he just controlled the ends of the feet. He's pinned both feet to the floor in a stack. He back stepped out and just basically rolled him into turtle and just instantly took his back and strangled him with seemingly no defensive actions from Mateus Denise, which is, I mean, incredible. It, it, I was watching it and I'm like, man, it looks like Mateus wasn't even, it looks like he wasn't even trying to defend, but that's when you know that you're, you know, the technique is so good that there's just, it doesn't even look like you can do anything. And, um, man, Nicholas Mirgali, his no gi, it's looking like it's catching up to his gi abilities. He's the best in the world at the gi. And now he's beating all of these guys back to back to back, uh, in dominant fashion in no gi. So who are his last three matches? He had, uh, Kynan submitted him. This last match was, uh, Mateus Denise. He submitted him. Uh, and I'm missing, I'm missing one of the other ones. Anyways, this guy 
is fucking unreal. Oh, Lovato, right? Um, beats Lovato handedly. This he's just he beats everyone now in Nogi, and you know I'm. I, it makes you wonder about Gordon and when he comes back and uh, is this a match that could ever potentially happen, right? They, they're they're such uh, made such good friends now that it would be very interesting to see them fight. But if the stars align, you know, Gordon's the uh, the absolute champ and then Mick, Nicholas Marigali wins the absolute division, I guess it has to happen, right? I mean, you can't not let it happen. But who knows? With Gordon's health issues, we don't even know if he's going to be... Um, you know, competing long term here. I honestly, uh, I hate to say this, just with the way that his health conditions have reoccurred and the severity of the conditions, I tend to think that, uh, and I hope I'm wrong because I love watching Gordon. I, there's no other athlete that I learn more from when I watch, but um, I, uh, it, it looks like his health concerns are probably, uh, they're going to, probably put a premature end to his career at some point. And that's really, really sad, but you know, he's, uh, it's amazing what he's already accomplished. And again, I just hope that uh, he can sort of overcome that because I know what it's like to have health issues, especially with gut issues. Okay. Now the fine, the main event, Craig Jones versus half Hill Lovato jr. Um, I didn't really think Lovato would have a chance just because I know how slick Craig is. I know where his, um, I know where his strengths are and Lovato's got that top pressure game, but at the same time, Craig, you know, there's only very few guys who could pin Craig and just crush him. I would, I would think yeah, probably Gordon, uh, uh, Kynan, and I didn't see Lovato being able to do that to him in the key probably, but in, in, uh, in Nogi, I don't think so. And then Craig hit Lovato with a beautiful heel hook, uh, from 50, 50. It was nasty. And Lovato didn't want to tap at first. And then you saw Craig go into a full extension on the heel hook. Uh, that's pretty much exactly how I saw it going down. I'm not surprised at all again. So I felt that the matches overall were pretty predictable, but still uh, an, an amazing event. It was uh, super fun to watch. I really enjoy these rules. A uh, question that I have for you guys watching, because somebody asked me this and uh, uh, I kind of struggled with the question a little bit. And that's should ADCC happen on a yearly basis rather than every two years? I thought it was an interesting question because um, I like how it's every two years because it makes you look forward to it more. But their argument was that you know, if it's every year, then it will be more launched to the mainstream. It will be more available. There will just be more opportunity for growth. And uh, yeah, let me go. Let me know what you guys think in the comments. Should ADCC be, you know, once a year? What do you like once every two years? I think with once every two years, it just adds so much more hype to it. But again, I'm not going to argue if you tell me that there's going to be uh, ADCC world championships twice in a year. All right. So, and man, I'm going to be looking forward to that. I believe the, the ADCC is taking place in September this year, um, in Las Vegas. Plus we have West coast trials in Vegas at the end of the month. Um, I have a couple guys going down for that tournament. I won't be there because of my shoulder. And, uh, you know, at the same time, you know, I got a, a guy like Harrison Woods who's in the 170 pound division. I don't know how this kid makes 170s. That's my the division that I would compete in. And at this point in my career, I don't think I could beat him under that rule set. And also uh, I don't really want to uh, have to go through one of my guys to, to win a tournament like that. Being an instructor at this point, uh, I know where my jujitsu is. I know uh, with my age, you know, he's half my age and um, I, I want to see these young guys win. So uh, it made more sense for me to sit this one out and to just let my shoulder heal and to just hope that uh, that, you know, guys like him can go and do it. And this is just part of the natural life cycle of an instructor is you realize when your students who, <laughs> you know, Harrison is as old as I was when I started, he's a black belt and he could fuck me up now. It's, it's a crazy thing to think about. Um, just seeing how the next generation has improved so much, you know, and, um, and, and how I can no longer hang with those guys and how this guy's so much bigger than me, but he can make 170. Uh, and, and that's just so impressive to me. So I want someone like him, by the way, Harrison Woods, uh, you should definitely check him out. He just won the Polaris qualifiers for the pro grand prix, which is happening next month, I believe in London. He just won that event about a week ago in England and he dominated everyone. And he said, 
you know, it was pretty fucking easy. So I think he's he's got some big things on uh, in his future for sure. All right. And that's basically the podcast. Um, hopefully I didn't forget anything. So guys, check out uh, that Donkey Guard video. I'll leave it in. I'll leave it in the show notes on the bottom. Start playing with Donkey Guard. Next time when you go into K-Guard and you start entangling your partner's legs, uh, don't entangle the legs. Entangle the entire body and then start looking for uh, sweeps. Keep the le- at least one leg in front of you. Start attacking toe holds and see how attacking foot locks will also lead into sweeps. There's just so many good dilemmas from that position. Sweeps and foot locks. Um, you know, switching from one foot to another. It's so hard for the person to defend unless you watch the video that I'm about to leave you and you learn how to escape the position. Uh, and if you guys are doing eco at your gym, which, you know, I, I recommend that you do involve some kind of live training for sure. Positional sparring training. I think everyone's doing that now. Uh, start doing donkey guard games because, you'll you'll be amazed how hard it can be to get out. And when you put yourself there, you'll be amazed how often and uh, easy you can submit and sweep your opponents from donkey guard. Uh, That being said, I'm not a huge fan of just jumping donkey guard uh, a la Jeff Glover. I like to enter with more um, leg entanglement based situations. And that's the show for you guys. All right. I hope uh, a little bit of a shorter one today. I hope that you enjoyed it and please leave me comments in the comment section, like, share, subscribe. If you want to support the show, the links are in the bottom. Uh, I really appreciate all the support guys. Love it. And hope you're enjoying the show so far. Remember everyday jujitsu podcast is everything you need to know about jujitsu. All right. See you later guys. Bye. Bye.